On today's More Than a Test, we welcome Dr. Rod Berger and Mark Angel. Let's just say I was more than a little bit nervous for this interview. Mark Angel is the CEO and co-founder of Amira Learning, AKA my boss with the most amazing history you could possibly imagine. That includes everyone from Steve Jobs to Reagan and some of those stories come out. And then Rod Berger is the storyteller master. He's conducted over 3,000 interviews across the globe with people like Mac Magic Johnson and the Pope and even Mark Angel for Forbes magazine. He is incredible. Mark is incredible. I'm lucky to be part of the conversation and just wait till you hear what they have to say at the end about AI and the way we should all be engaging with it in our world. Thanks for being here on More Than a Test. All right, Mark, Rod, the New York Times says I have two more weeks of saying Happy New Year. So Happy New Year. Thanks for being here. Happy New Year. Awesome. Rod, I want to start with you because whether or not people follow your podcast or know exactly who you are, they've definitely seen your byline. You have done profiles of just amazing people all over the world. I think your website says something like 3,000 interviews. I have to know, how do you decide whose story is important and valuable and that there's something here that you want to learn about? That's a great question, Laura. Um, well, if you talk to my wife, she says I probably say yes too, too often. Uh, I'm a sucker. I'm a sucker for the pitch. I get around 200 pitches a day. Um, that come in and most often it's the one that will approach me in a way that says, I don't think you're going to take this. I don't think you're going to want to tell this story because we're probably not big enough or interesting enough or iconic enough. I'm actually really interested in that. I have more joy out of in the little way that I can hopefully provide some platform to allow a story to sort of breathe right? Sort of, it's like the decanter of stories, like allow it to breathe, get it out there. Because I think that's, that's the power is you get inspired. You either listen to something or you read something or you watch a movie or a documentary and you say, wow, that person's like me or wow, that, that's like my sister or my neighbor. Right. And if you're a kid, you say, I want to aspire to be like that. So I don't think we learn a lot from those iconic names as much as we do the ones that we should, I think, celebrate. Okay, you said that you get more joy from these stories that maybe people haven't heard. Tell me about a story recently that gave you a lot of joy. Oh, gosh, where do I start? I mean, I, I'll say this. Over the last two years, I have been incredibly blessed to travel the globe. And so I have found myself in person in places uh, in the world that I don't think many people would get the the opportunity to. I mean, you know, last year I was sitting in a refugee camp on the northern border um, of Uganda, uh, you know, s spending time with people that have been there from South Sudan for over six years and there to understand the power of story that goes back thousands of years. That to me is, it's an honor. It's not even, look, it's a kid in a candy store who loves storytelling and understands that everybody has a story and it's so powerful. Um, so they all, they all hit me. I don't know if it, it you know, Look, there's the occasional, here's how I say it, Laura. There's the, the occasional interview where it's, I just say to myself, oh, we're just missing the meat, you know, like kind of really what's that person like? And I know we're going to talk a little bit about Mark uh, and my experience with Mark, but like Mark is a great example. And I don't want to preempt your questions here, but people like Mark who are willing to share in a transparent way their journey, that to me is so powerful. So I have more of that than I, than I don't. Um, you know, I, I will mention to give you one name, but Sammy Hagar of Van Halen, you know, I mean, that's a moment where I say, how am I interviewing Sammy Hagar of Van Halen? We spent the majority of that conversation talking about growing up in the lettuce fields of Salinas, California and coming from nothing and where his grandfather had a double wide where he would, even though in those circumstances, his grandfather would make food and he said, you could smell it like just walking up towards his his home and the the way in which he connected with that and the power of that, the power of taste, the power of culture and coming together in family, that was much more, I think, exciting um, and revelatory than his music career. Okay. You said so many things there that I want to dial into. So one of the things is you said you listen to interviews and you don't hear the meat on them. Tell me how, how is your storytelling different that yours end up with the meat on them? Well, so I'm going to use somebody else's words. So I interviewed Aaron Rasmussen, uh, one of my favorite interviews over the last five years. He's uh, one of the co-founders of Masterclass. Incredible. He's a savant, 
He's absolutely brilliant. I've spent time with him in person, and then we've had a number of phone calls and, and video interviews. But he made a comment to me, and he's a fantastic storyteller. He just said that, uh, he said a lot of people will see a line, and they will acknowledge the line and not cross it, like in a conversation. But for whatever reason, I will approach it, cross that line, and extend my hand, and the recipient or the person on the other side of that line will actually join with me and then cross back over that line. And so I think that maybe goes back to my mental health days where if, you're ha if you have to have a serious conversation with somebody, you can't be afraid to ask a serious question because we want to be heard. That, that's the crux of it. And so I, that's always my, I want to, I'm going to ask something and I'm going to err on the side of, you know what, we're both humans. And so if I do it in a way that is hopefully um, not intrusive, Right, and I do with some humility that you're going to be willing to answer that, and now we've connected at a different level. And you're going to say to me, "No one's asked me that question." So that if you want to know what my goal is in every interview, I want you to say that. I want you to say, "I've never been asked that." A point of pride was earlier last summer I interviewed Magic Johnson, and we're both Michigan State Spartans, so that helped me, I think, in the interview. And uh, and and we were together in Los Angeles. And I asked him a question about mental health and entrepreneurism. And he had said he'd never been asked the, that in the way in which I asked him. And that was a real point of pride for me because one, it's an important topic for me. Um, and two, to be able to do that with someone who's interviewed, you know, I mean, countless times in a given week, right? So that's my objective. So anybody who asks me about how to interview, ask the question that's in the back of your mind that if you're watching an interview, say, why don't you ask that question? Have you ever crossed a line and regretted it? Knock on wood, no. I, I wow. cannot recall one time where I where there was pushback. Not one time. Now, I've had the reverse where I've had publicists, especially on the celebrity side, where they have been very, and that's sort of a fun experience where, you know, at, in the beginning of the relationship, they own it. You've got, you know, X number of minutes with Laura. <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden, guess what? Laura's enjoying the interview and doesn't want it to stop. And sometimes a publicist will come in and say, that's it. We're done. And then they get an earful from their client, which says, I really enjoyed that conversation. Why did you cut it off? Um, so knock on wood, that has not happened. But um, maybe I have and they haven't told me. <laughs> uh, let's, okay, so let me. So you say you, it's about going deeper. You ask the question that you've been wanting to ask that nobody else is willing to ask. But there are a lot of people who are on brand. They're on message. I love Mark, but man, Mark can hit the reading message all day long, no matter what you ask him. So here's, so how do you get deep on somebody who's well-trained? You stop the elevator in between two floors, but I will absolutely agree with you, Laura. There are, there are people who are so well-versed and so professional that out of the gate, it's like, it's the opposite of these movies. It's like a horse movie, you know, where it's like, where they're going to train, you know, this sort of, the stallion is out there and we've got to sort of break the horse down to get it to then sort of, you know, abide by our rules and what we're trying to do and accomplish here, maybe with a race or something like that. It's the opposite. They're so polished that you say, how do I get past this? They've been like, every talking point is covered. Their media kit is immaculate. Um, and so I try to, I don't know, I try to throw them a curveball, but not one that's a, a, a gotcha at all. It's something that makes them pause, talk about something that's personal, like family, kids, you know, how they think about things. I love to ask people their relationship to something. So one of my favorite questions is, you know, like I would ask you, Laura, tell me about your relationship to success. How has that changed over the years? Not just as a professional, but as a woman. It's interesting you say this. It's funny because um, I'm not going to fully answer it, but I will say my our offsite was just on evangelism. We just did an entire thing on evangelism uh, over our over the last few days for our company. And it's interesting because my family defines success very seriously around you help children in schools. Like that is what the most successful thing is. And and this whole ed tech thing has been interesting for them. And so the last couple of years, it's so I can see how good you are <laughs> at your job. So that's so interesting. Um, you you know you said that the iconic ones are not your favorites, but you know you brought up Magic Johnson. Is there somebody that you haven't interviewed that you wish you could? Well, I, just to be just to be clear, I love all of those interviews, and one of the reasons why. And, and a lot of people will say to me, "Well, why do you interview such a, a wide range of people?" Well, that's like saying if you go to the gym, why do you do all kinds of different exercises? Like, why would I not want to work every muscle that I have over time? Because that's just going to 
that's going to increase my likelihood that in a given moment where maybe someone else would be nervous or they wouldn't be able to step up to the moment that I'm able to because I've been there, whether it's talking with a refugee about hopelessness or sitting with Magic Johnson. Um, so I, you know, selfishly, I learn from those experiences. Um, one that I haven't had yet. Uh, well, I, number one on that list would probably be Obama. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Speaking to my heart right there. <laughs> and if you had him, you'd have to have Michelle and do the well, whole thing. I was going like, to say, right? too, when I say Obama, <laughs> did I say Michelle or Barack? I didn't say which one, right? Um, oh. <laughs> just because I think they're fantastic interviews as people, um, that's really compelling to me. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see what the stars have all, have aligned, but um, those would probably be two that would come up to the top of the list. Okay. I want to ask one more question about you, and then I'm going to ask yep. about storytelling. We'll get to Mark. So um, the question that comes to mind for me is when I ask Mark a question about his life, he always tells me about a person, right? So I asked him once um, how he makes everyone feel like he has nowhere else to be. Um, Cause if you ever with Mark, he always acts like there's no, he, I know what his schedule looks like. He has somewhere else to be. He always acts like it's the only place he has to be. And he said, I learned that from working with Reagan. Like he worked with Reagan at one point and learned that. And so I want to know when you think about all of your interviews, what is an interview? What's a conversation that changed you? A conversation that changed me. Oh gosh. That, that... I don't know if there's one, a bunch of them sort of just came to the front of my mind. I will say there are moments where I have felt emotional in the moment for sure. I pro I would probably lean on ones that have been in person. Like I, it wasn't even a formal interview and I actually kicked myself. There's a young man at the refugee camp that if I get a chance to go back, it's singular. I just want to go back to see him. Uh, he, I had been walking through this refugee camp and I noticed this young man in his twenties just sitting in a chair, a plastic chair, sitting there staring as if he wanted me to say hello or acknowledge him. And I just walked up to him and we sat and had a conversation. He was 25. He was too old to go to the school at the refugee camp. So he had already sort of filtered out of the formal education that was at least offered at the refugee camp. And yet, so he was too old for that, but he wanted to be a medical doctor. So you tell me what kind of hope someone who's 25 sitting in a refugee camp with nothing to do but aspirations to help. When his entire family, he had lost his entire family outside of his mother to the wars in South Sudan, and his mother had returned to Sudan from the refugee camp because she didn't feel any hope in a refugee camp. So it's probably, you know what, Laura, as you asked that question, it's probably the ones that I didn't get a chance to actually record, but I treat it as if they were an interview. That's pro Those are the ones that I just go, gosh, because that could be so, I think, powerful, not just for someone there, but maybe a kid in Cleveland or a kid in Toronto. It do, you know, it does not matter. That, that's one of the things that I've learned over the years is that it's fascinating and it sounds maybe trite, but it's all relative. Like, if we, you know, if you're in the middle of, of, of somewhere that is desolate or a developing country, the issues they're having, they're so, they're human. And we have the same experiences, but it's just, we have different, there's a different veneer to it. Right. Like I can be in a suburb and still experience the challenges personally as a human, my frailty, frailty, uh, you know, my insecurities as someone who, I don't know, is down and out in Rome. Uh, it, it, that's fascinating to me. Mark, I can't follow it up. I've got chills. Tell us about a conversation that changed you. Yeah, well, uh, uh, one of the conversations that really led to Amira uh, was with a school teacher who uh, had used the software we built at Renaissance for a number of years, and she loved it. Uh, but she basically looked at me and said, you know, Accelerated Reader is great. It's nice. We use it. But can you build me something that uh, actually helps students learn to read? And it was a, a wake-up moment because I think we all know when we're immersed in uh, uh, creating something, we we tend to uh, uh, think deeply about its strengths and and the accomplishments associated with that thing. And that was a wake up call conversation for me that uh, our focus was not where it needed to be. Wow, it's really powerful. I think sometimes teachers forget just how much power they have when they hit that right note, but they do it all the time. And so doing it for you, I think, was a special gift. And, and Laura, um, can I can I just touch on what Mark said there? Because I think it's absolutely gold. 
like that is what I experienced with Mark when I did my interview with him, which is he just shared a level of transparency that you can't teach. Like I've been guest lecturing at Vanderbilt's business school for almost 20 years now, which just makes me feel tired. But, <laughs> um, it, but that is something that most students don't get, which is even when you're in a position of leadership, even when you've had a level of success and you've built a legacy, even if it's a foot high, you still have the opportunity to be transparent and human. And he just basically admitted sort of a flaw in the process of being so focused in business that you miss exactly what you're trying to accomplish in the first place and acknowledging that and allowing that to then fuel the next iteration or the next company. Like that to me is really powerful. Okay, which is kind of where we're going. So I love it when someone leads me to my segue. It makes me a lot, it makes my job a lot easier. You mentioned 200 pitches a day. Yeah. of people who want to be interviewed with you. And Mark is someone you interviewed two years ago for Forbes magazine. What was it that made Mark compelling? I mean, next to Magic Johnson and the Pope, Mark, you're fabulous, but. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that lead, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, look, it's the, it's the, when we think about literacy, when we think about science, I'm so fascinated with technology and I am always looking for sort of what what's an indicator of what's next. Because I'll tell you something, maybe this is sort of the, the backside of the coin, the other side of the coin, which is, you know, I'll be at a soccer practice and in the suburbs here, right? And sort of living my life and talking with parents. And when they're not aware of what is out there, whether it's already sort of available for their children or is sort of on the come, I get so disappointed because I think, wow, what if you knew that that was coming? How might that change the way in which you think about supporting your child, right? And it sort of it goes on and on and on. And so I always want to try to be um, on top of it as much as I can. And like right now, I'm interviewing a lot of people in the AI space because I think I don't think people are paying attention to it. I think it's really nice. And they say, oh, it's going to, you know, it'll be here, but it's not here yet. No, it's here. And it's already like 4.0. So, you, you know, whether you're an educator in higher education or you're at the elementary level, it will change and is changing our lives for the good, the bad, the ugly, right? But I think we have to, it's a language. So that when, when it came to Mark, it was, wow, what is going on here? I want to understand more. I think there's great power in what I'm seeing from Amira. And let me understand a little bit more about the person behind it. Okay, let me ask you kind of the flip side question, Mark, because if you go to the Amira's website, it'll be hard to find Mark on there, despite the fact that like he is the person behind it and has been talking about this for decades, according to other people. You know, you don't see like that big about um, Mark page. So Mark, when you decide to do an interview like this and let yourself be the face of Amira, like wh wh why Rod and, and why would you agree to that? Well, listen, uh, everything is about the mission and the goal. Uh, you mentioned, Laura, that uh, when you're trying to create a new thing in the world, uh, there's an infinity of ways you can time splice your day. There's an infinity of investments you can make to try to further the cause. So everything comes down to, you know, where is the evangelical payoff? Uh, for the most part, I guess my personal belief is that if people are interested enough uh, in Amira to go to the website, what they really want to know about is uh, how uh, the uh, innovation can be helpful to them in their concrete uh, journey to help kids read. Uh, but often it is the story uh, that grabs people and directs them uh, towards uh, uh, a situation or a technology or a new thing. So uh, uh, with somebody of Rod's reputation and reach, uh, it was an easy call to, to say this is a place where uh, the evangelical moment might be uh, worth the uh, the time and investment. I know it's a couple of years old now, but do you remember a moment where you felt like Rod was crossing the line and pulling you back during your interview? No, it never, it never. <laughs> so he's one more check mark in Rod's uh, sterling record from that crossing the line. Never, never had the, the faintest idea of that. Did to to his point, did really appreciate that it was not a rote conversation. I think for all of us who uh, uh, interact with the media and interact with uh, 
things that are associated with public relations. The wearying part is when you just feel like it's the same old, same old, and somebody's following that uh, tried and true checklist, and it never felt uh, for a second like that. And that is incredibly stimulating and obviously thought-provoking as, as uh, uh, the person on the other end of those questions. For me, when I read the article, the question about social emotional learning in Amira was the question where he's crossed a line that most people don't want to have that conversation about, right? Like to me, this is everyone, everyone kind of thinks about it, but nobody really says what is the impact of putting an avatar in front of a child? Yeah, well, it's a great example of that question that I think everybody wants to ask. And it's a great example of the question that, you know, from somebody who gets a lot of questions, it was fantastic to actually have that front and center. Uh, I mentioned then that uh, uh, this has probably been the most interesting part of the Amira journey and that from the get-go, uh, some of the really knowledgeable people around AI and avatars had told us uh, that we would underestimate and underappreciate the degree to which uh, any time you offer up technology in a semi-human guise, uh, you create a relationship and interaction that's both uh, complex, but also potentially amazingly fruitful. And I would say, Rod, two years later, uh, we know a lot more, but we're still in the early days of our understanding of Amira's potential to create a bond uh, with the student that's constructive for both the teacher, the parent, and that child. So. We do, however, have also have lots of stories of kids trying to ask her to be a friend, let them go to the bathroom, or go on a date with them. So they're trying to connect with her, whether or not that's our intention. Um, Rod, it feels... Go ahead. Rod, we, for, we've, we're we kind of in this, like, I guess for you, I'm sure it feels like a super long moment around storytelling, but you see this like really continue to grow momentum in that like there was like TED Talk period where like, every, like all we did was watch TED Talks. And now you see on LinkedIn, there's like chief storytelling off telling officer is a new role that I've seen a lot of lately. And I'm just curious, like for you, like, has it always been like this? Have you always kind of seen this kind of wave coming? Is it actually new? Like I'm perceiving it with where this interest in storytelling is new. And if it is like, where is it coming from and why is it gaining so much momentum? I think it, um, you know what? It's almost like, it's like we had a near death moment as professionals. And then we went, wait a minute, I need to start to appreciate what's around me, you know? Um, and we said, we had our Jimmy Stewart moment and said, I, I think I need to sit back and say, it is a wonderful life. What's powerful? And it's really my story because it's been here the whole time, but we have just, we, we, everything needs to be repeatable, right? Because that's easier to count. It's easier, easier to budget around. It's easier to track. And we see it in younger people. Like when I work with the students, the graduate students at Vanderbilt, all I ask for are their resumes and half, the, more than half the time, it's all the same. They bury the lead. The most interesting thing about them is at the bottom of their resume or it's not even included because they think we want to see elements that basically say that they could masquerade as a robot, not a human. And that's not interesting and that's not valuable in the market. And so, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly happy that the HBR, the Harvard Business Reviews of the World are putting storytelling on their cover repeatedly because they understand that in a, in a world where we're trying to understand hybrid, remote, uh, value propositions and and even the balance sheet, we've got to find a way to bring people together along our mission uh, so that we can grow and, and sustain viable businesses. And when you're working with the younger generation or the generation on the come, you know what? It's about purpose over profits. And so they don't really at some point care at the widget you might be selling. They want to know that they like you. That goes to the storytelling that Mark's uh, referencing. And that's what they can get behind. So I'm just, I feel like I'm sort of, you know, dumb lucky that there are people that are these chief storytelling officers. And I'll be honest with you, I've had a number of brands that have asked me to serve in that capacity because they've said, why don't we, why don't we just sort of let that, why don't we run with that? Because that's going to be far more interesting than the white noise of saying, what is that, you know, I don't know, a new benefit in our technology, because sadly, nobody cares that's exactly why you have technologies that they're sort of winning the market race. And you say, why? It's a bad technology. Well, just because it's been there. <laughs> and part of it is we're lazy as consumers, which is fine. We have a lot going on, but it doesn't mean that they're, it's the best in class. Not at all. There are too many people. There are too many options. Um, so I'm, I'm just lucky that we're at a point in time where people are 
they're relating to that. I mean, my TEDx talk last year was on story is our currency. And, you know, th that generated a lot of interest. And so I'm now upping the ante in my public speaking around the world. And I'm excited about that because it means there's an appetite, an audience to understand how to tell stories. You don't have to be like me or you, Laura, or Mark. You all, we can all be storytellers in our own right, but it's about how do we understand and support and I think celebrate the power of inquiry. That's what it's about. Even in an AI world, we've got to be able to inquire, ask questions, and that's how we build the prompts that will drive businesses in the future. Mark, I know he's preaching to the choir with you because every time I, like I said, I've heard about Steve Jobs, I've heard about Reagan, I've heard about the Sonoma Zoo from you. You always got a story. What, what would you add? Well, I'd add something about this moment in time. Uh, when you sort of look at the, the history of art, there was this amazing moment where uh, artists had to go from being the recorders of history and that was the painting or the icon that told the story. And then we got to photography and that kind of uh, need for an artist to literally depict reality changed. And what switched? Uh, artists became abstract. They became expressionist. They became impressionist. And I think that we need to recognize this moment in time we're at. It's precisely because of AI and the deepness of technology, we don't need a lot of uh, people and communication to get raw information. It's now everywhere. Right? We're drowning in it. We can enter any query we want into chat GPT and uh, be told about every single fact, every single uh, relevant statistic. But what people can do and probably will always do better is to tell that story. So I really believe it's this moment in time that has permissioned us uh, to move away from the emphasis on the dry, dry conveyance of information and get into a a place where the story is the power. Okay, I'm going to push back on that a little bit, Mark, because I'm going to tell you what my experience is here at Amira is randomized control trial after trial will tell you how well Amira works. We just had a huge report come out that basically said that we had nothing to do with that basically said Amira is going to help your kids read. The product in front of your kids right now is not like comparison. We send these things to people in sales all the time and it goes nowhere. But then they send them one video of one teacher being like, hey, it works and it changes the game. And so I, in some ways it feels, it feels like we're missing the point of like, cause like to me, the data is the point. What would you say to that? Should the stories be overpowering the data? So, so I, think, I think we all know as storytellers that to some degree we're exploiting the quirk in the human brain where uh, statistics and large scale data doesn't register on us quite as much as the story. Uh, I, I think, this is where to be a good storyteller, you need to figure out how to tell a story that is locked into what really matters. And I think some of this, Laura, is maybe us just not being good enough storytellers yet about how to think about uh, data at scale, right? Yes, uh, everybody's going to lock into the anecdote about the individual child who's benefited, but this is in one respect how we've gone so wrong in education uh, when we're helping 60 million kids, uh, uh, one student's going to be helped by everything or anything, right? And we need to be focused on the fact that at the end of the day, our stories have to be grounded uh, in an objective understanding of what truly works and what doesn't. So, yeah. so we, I have we, a thought we, on that, Laura, if you don't mind I, me. I it. was going to say, you look like you're about to jump in, Rob, so go for it. Well, no, it's just that I think that a, a general um, challenge that I don't care really what uh, sector you're in, but that brands have, companies have, is this notion of, it's like we, we would see this in early on in social media where you'd look at someone's Twitter feed, a company's feed, and it would be all about them. Or when Facebook came out, you would have all your friends and neighbors and it was all about them. And you kind of went, okay, you know, I love your kids and all, but I don't need to see them eating like fruits and vegetables every day, whatever it is. Uh, and I think some of that is with storytelling. So I agree wholeheartedly with Mark about the, the issue around data. D data can scramble, it like scrambles the brain when it comes to story and who in the world wants to either have a glass of wine with someone over data or go to a ball game. Like if you really kind of think about it, data is incredibly important and we can use that to stack wins against, right? Sort of the objective that we have on a given day for a company. But what I, what I wish more companies would do is to say, let's paint the picture. 
Like in a world where a mirror or any company is going to ser- or is going to thrive, if the objective is you can't tell me one benefit about a mirror, like as just a, as an activity, but what you can do is paint. It's like paint by number. Paint the rest of the room. Paint the classroom. Paint the community. What does that community look like? Like where are they suffering? Where are they struggling? Because that's how people connect. Think about even in in sort of relationships, partnerships, where you say, was it because I sat there and met somebody and I told them how great I am? Well, no, that's going to push them away. And if we know that we have thousands and thousands of education companies and everybody's touting how amazing they are and unique, you can see why the end end user recipient says, I'm just so... you know, just sort of sub out the name and the technology or where they are in their sprint. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. At the end of the day, I've got kids who are struggling in these areas or we need better HVAC systems and we're in the middle of Texas and it's hot. I'll talk to superintendents about, you know, their ESSER funding going, well, this is great, but I've got, a fi- I've got logistical sort of operational issues here. That's what I think the storytelling should be focused on. I don't, it doesn't have to be an education. Like paint the whole picture minus what you're, se- what you're selling because now they're going to go, I want to work with them. Tell me again what you sell. Uh, and that's where I think people are missing the opportunity. It takes me back to the Van Halen story, right? Is that it wasn't about the the Van Halen member. It was about the lettuce fields. It was about his father's trailer. You know, like to your point, there is so much more there that really informs why that person is so important and special and why that story matters. Yeah. And you can see these, like, uh, that reminds me, I, I can say that I did this. Not that I'm a UFC fan, a martial art, you know, ultimate fighting but I got the opportunity to sit in the octagon with the famous Habib Nurmagomedov. He's a hall of famer. And a lot of people would not want to stand anywhere near him because of how fearsome he was. We didn't talk about his fighting style. We didn't talk about any of that. We talked about, he wanted to talk about retiring and wanting to go back to his home country in his village and sell tomatoes to locals and vegetables. So painted that entire, everything outside of it and the visual of sitting in the octagon and all the responses from his fans, it was, they were so, it was like a refreshing uh, experience for them to learn about things that were important to this icon. That was what was impressive for them. It wasn't that we talked about stuff that they already knew, right? So I just think that that's such a, it's a, I think it's a great example of just, sometimes you can focus on everything outside or around what you're trying to sell. And people are going to pay attention and you're going to create sort of this unique opportunity to engage with a story or a brand. Well, and I think it also gives people the opportunity to see themselves in the story, right? Like I can't see myself as a member of Van Halen, but I can see myself at a lettuce field, right? I might not see myself. Sure, Laura. (laughs) (laughs) I might not be able to see myself as like a teacher using AI, but I want my kids to read. So this, and I know that classroom, I mean, I was just talking to the super, the commissioner of Rhode Island. She's talking about how in Providence, they're replacing every school. The ceilings are literally falling on children in some of the places in Providence. And so to your point, right, I can't, I might not be like the AI conversation might not be mine, but my school breaking down and my kids being behind is, is that is part of my conversation. That's great. All right. I have one more question kind of about the storytelling heroes thing. Um, you know, something that Mar- someone that Mark and I have talked about before, I just read um, when the heavens go on sale because he recommended it is Elon Musk. And I feel like he is everywhere. And I feel like he's somebody that the story is both like beautiful and tragic, depending on the day you open up your Twitter. Right. And I'm just curious, like, how, how do you how do we all reconcile a story like that? Like deep down, I think I want to root for him. I don't know. What, what do you think about that, Rod? And I'm going to ask you too, Mark, because you recommended the book. <laughs> so uh, I follow a lot of Elon Musk. I, I, to start off, I would say this. So I listen to countless podcasts every week. I fall asleep to them. I wake up to them. I drive listening to podcasts. And it's not that I'm listening potentially, or, or, or that I'm listening for the, the content. Like, what are they talking about? I'm listening for delivery the power of silence, of allowing someone to speak or have, so I'm like listening to the mechanics of that because it pushes the boundaries of my mind and the way in which I think about interviewing and talking to people. I love turn of phrase. So I'll follow journalists that I think have just fantastic turn of phrase where they just they have ownership of the language. Um, and so that's where I think about an Elon Musk and I say, okay, do I really want to get into the weeds of whatever he just said or who's he spending time with, you know, no, for me personally, no. 
but I do celebrate that he pushes the boundaries of what we think we can or cannot do. And all that does for me, then it translates. It's not that I'm sitting there saying, well, I'd like to build a tunnel system in Los Angeles because I lived there and traffic was terrible. And Elon's talked about that. Uh, it's that he then makes me think, okay, well, what if I pushed the boundaries in my world? What, what would I think about? So that's how I apply it. So, you know, I think it's, it's easy. It's sort of fodder. It's chum in the water to just focus on what he said when he was interviewed and talked about losing uh, advertisers, right. And, and cursing on stage and all these sorts of things. That's fine. That that's just easy though. I think that the, the more challenging and fruitful part of that is what is he, how does, how do people like him make us think bigger and bolder about ourselves and our contributions? Yeah. Mark, it looks like you agree. Well, I beyond agree. And one of the reasons that I, uh, had recommended the book that Laura mentioned is because really it's not a book about Elon Musk. It is a book about some of the other entrepreneurs who he inspired to uh, to take on smaller but similar missions. Right, one of the uh, heroes of the book is a uh, an entrepreneur in New Zealand who uh, founded Rocket Labs that doesn't get a lot of publicity, doesn't get a lot of uh, press, but uh, Rocket Labs has uh, uh, really filled the niche that Elon and his macro mission of going to Mars has left uh, open, uh, which is the niche of helping to get hundreds and hundreds of small satellites into orbit to do things like track environmental and climate change and to do things like help farmers be able to optimize their crops and deal with hunger. So uh, I, I think uh, for all his flaws, for, for all the things we may want to uh, uh, be concerned about either uh, in his uh, uh, tweets or in his behavior, the big picture is what Rod talked about. This is one of those very, very rare people who shows up uh, with an incredible vision and does something about it and paints a picture for the rest of us about how uh, one human being can really matter. And that's pretty special. That is special um, and, and a really lovely way to look at it. I'm, I'm going to take us back to something that Rod said a while ago, which was he's talking about how he's interviewing a lot of people about AI right now. And I would be remiss if we ended this conversation and didn't talk about AI with the two of you. One of my personal favorite stories comes from Dan Carroll, who is a co-founder of um, Clever, which is another ed tech product. And when he and I met, he said, you know, Mark's been talking about this for like 10 to 15 years. The first time I met Mark, we all were sitting in a room at Renaissance and all he would talk about was, was an AI reading tool. And we all thought he was nuts. Like, <laughs> and so Mark, I wonder, you know, when you, when you think about this, like Rod is saying, you know, we're already at 4.0. The moment is here. Is he right? Is the moment here with AI has, has, you know, what you've been saying for 10 years come into fruition. How do you feel? Well, the moment is here, but for those of us who have lots of gray hair and lots of longevity, we know that the moments come and go in technology. This is not AI's first moment. It probably won't be the last. It's in the nature of tech that uh, we achieve breakthroughs. We uh, profoundly change the way people uh, engage in their lives day to day. And then we plateau uh, and it takes us some time to, to get to the next uh, level of breakthrough. But this is absolutely one of those moments when tech is going to uh, uh, reform, rechange, uh, redo uh, almost every aspect of how people function. And uh, it's right up there with the internet and television and automobiles as a, uh, uh, a thing that uh, is going to be profoundly societal sh uh, shaping. So it's here. Rod, I've I feel like you said this is the moment I would say, and, and you feel like people aren't paying attention. If people are listening right now and, and are trying to pay attention, what would you say they need to know, they need to think about to be, you know, part of this moment? Mark says this is like the internet and I can, I can feel myself being like, shoot, maybe I'm behind. <laughs> what would you say? <laughs> um, here's what I would say. I interviewed Hadi Portovi, the founder of Code.org, which many know. Uh, millions of students, young people around the world utilize that. An amazing guy, a fantastic personal story uh, that I recommend people research. And he's talked about AI and he said to me, you know, what people don't understand is that this is probably the slowest point of innovation we're going to be at right now. 
Like we think if we're at the soccer fields or a dance class or at a movie theater, we think, oh, we're going right. No, no, no. This is the slowest point. <laughs> so in essence, if, if there's a time to start to read up or to at least investigate and explore, this would be the time because it's only going up from here. And, and that I think supports, I agree with Mark. I mean, this is, whether we like it or not, or whether we're prepared for it, this is television, right? Coming online. This is every sort of, um, accomplishment that we have as, as a species, this is that and more in what it will be able to do the good and the bad. Um, and if you want to see both, both ends of that, there is a fantastic documentary series on Netflix called unknown. There are four documentaries. I interviewed one I would recommend. I interviewed a, one of this called Cave of Bones. And it's this uh, archaeologist that was the first named National Geographic Explorer, Dr. Lee Berger. And I reached out to him because we had the same last name and we kind of developed a friendship that way. And then he had this great documentary. So I recommend that. But one of them is on killer robots and it's about AI in the military. And it doesn't mean this is about sort of anybody's position politically at all. It's just what are they doing and I can just tell you that they had researchers from Duke University who, like on a Friday, changed an algorithm just to see what would happen before they left that following week for Europe for a conference. 40,000 biological weapon recipes basically emerged by substituting a one for a zero or a zero for a one. One of the most powerful things, and I watch documentaries all the time. I mean, it was like rewind, play, rewind, play, just to understand. Now, it's going to do amazing things when it comes to the way in which we learn, the way in which we diagnose and treat health conditions that have been perplexing us for generations. Um, but again, like Elon Musk as a backdrop, how we push our minds to understand how the world is changing uh, and fast. Okay, Mark, I'm going to ask you this next question because I think that you'll have a good answer to it. So I hear what you're saying and I'm all for it. Like, I'm going to go watch the documentary. If you haven't, I'm sure you are too. But the New York Times just said that what people are experiencing with AI when they want to explore, like you're telling us to do, is it kind of plateaus. Like the first few things you do with ChatGPT is super cool. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, it's not as cool as I thought. What would you tell people to push through that? It's not as cool or that moment, that plateau. Yeah. Look, Gartner has long talked about this sort of notion of a hype cycle. And it's just, again, I think an attribute of human psychology that uh, we start with uh, awe and amazement and we quickly get bored and we quickly uh, understand the limitations of something. Uh, even the most incredible innovation is going to go through uh, that hype cycle. The internet went through the, the dot-com bust, right? We, we, it takes us time uh, to learn how to really make use of uh, uh, these breakthroughs. But I'll say two things. One's just following up on what uh, Rod was talking about. One of the things that makes AI unique as an innovation is it's the first innovation that's inherently self-perpetuating, right? All other innovations were a thing, and that was that. Uh, but AI is going to perpetuate its own uniqueness and its own power. Um, and that story that Rod told about how a modest shift can create a a uh, profound change in behavior is going to be a story we're going to hear over and over again with AI because uh, uh, we're, we'll get to the place where uh, AI is building the next generation of AI, and that's already starting to happen. So one, uh, we can expect that the rate of change and the rate of improvement in this particular world will be something we've never seen before. But the other thing I'll just say, and Laura, you know this was... Uh, an email I sent out to, to all the folks on Amira just a few days ago is, is that we need to see AI as a companion in our day-to-day -day lives, and we need to figure out how it can help us. Um, and that takes a little bit of time, right? Uh, everybody's going to be different in that respect. Uh, some of us will... Uh, find value in AI's artistic component and ability to help us creatively. Some of us will find it uh, as a tool to help us be more efficient. Sadly, some of us will find it as uh, 
uh, the lever that causes us to lose our job and our career and forces us to go on to the next thing. So uh, we're, we're all going to have to explore and discover how AI can be meaningful to us. And by the way, this is another somewhat difference between some of those other momentous uh, kinds of uh, innovations. But I will point out that it took us a while to discover, for example, how to really make use of the car in our daily lives. That just didn't happen overnight. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really well put. Um, I do again remiss if I didn't talk about education. There was an article that was everywhere on LinkedIn for a while, and I, everyone was reading that said basically, education is going to change more in the next five years than it has in the last I don't know fifty one hundred however long it was. And then it was literally the day afterwards I reread a book called Teachers and Machines by Larry Cuban, and the very first quote is I think like Thomas Edison or something. It was like. Uh, Motion pictures are going to completely change teaching. We won't have textbooks anymore. We will all watch movies. It is like this quote about how like this is going to, and, and it didn't, like we all know that's not like, actually what happened. But I think that you're on the side of this article that we're about to see this huge transformation in education. Rod, I know you talk to a lot of educators. What do you think? Well, I would agree that it's going to change, but I, but I take it from a diff maybe a different approach. And it goes back to the, the last question and answer uh, exchange with you and Mark is that I think that there's an assumption we're making here that AI is something that you can either do or can be done to you, but I don't see it that way at all. And this goes to education. I mean, it's like, like if I said to you, like, what is your experience with microplastics, Laura? You'd say, well, that's kind of a goofy question. And I'd say, well, you know what? That's one of the dangers in our drinking water, right? And so it's something that's there that you don't know is there, but it is changing changing you as a human, <laughs> right? It's, it has impact or potential impact. And not that I'm saying AI is bad. I don't mean it in that way. I just mean that it's there and it's not going to be something that even if we go and bump our heads up against chat GPT, even in a classroom, I think that's missing the point of what AI is because it is so, to, to Mark's great point about being inherently self-perpetuating, that changes the entire game. I actually think educators should they should think maybe in a more sort of Musk fashion, just in understanding professional development and sort of if we had to break it down. And I've been asking people, if we live in a world where the answers are provided, and by the way, this is very broad based and general in notion, but education has been traditionally about seeking out the answer. And we stack those answers and say, then we know something, we have built some capacity, right? And comprehension for the world around us. And that gives us a certificate, a degree of expertise in a special sector. Okay, but what if I now know the, the answers are there? We haven't even talked about quantum. Like, th there are so many elements here where I do think, and I and I challenged uh, Conrad Wolfram of Wolfram Alpha. They're the founders of Siri and some of the most famous mathematicians. And I said, but do we not have to live? Do we not have to think about a world where the answers are provided? And if that is the case, how do we deconstruct education? How do we understand it? Maybe from a project-based learning, understanding SCL, what are the impacts? But do I want my child to just acquire knowledge or alternatively have the ability to deconstruct what is being presented to them? Yeah. And that Mark to me is, is the question. And how, to your point, how is education going to change over the next five years? I think it's going to be, it, it has to be in that regard. And if, if we don't do it, another country is going to do it and they're going to be filling the supply chain with talent that is running circles around our own and we've missed an opportunity. So I, I do think we have to, we have to think bold and we have to think about sort of, wow, end of days here, not, but like force ourselves to say, what if we have to remove the model we have? And so many teachers are primed for it, right? Like COVID created a situation where we had to be like that. I, I tell people all the time, I remember being a principal and a teacher crying because it was changing so fast. And I was like, no, this is the good part, right? Like this is the moment where we just throw everything out and say, what would we do if all we could do is what we wanted, you know, and, and that changed. So I think you're right. There's this moment and, and it could be possible that also our teaching force could go with it because of what they've just recently been through. Mark, what would you add? Not much. Uh, I would just say that, uh, uh, uh as somebody who's, uh, been associated with what we now call AA for a long time, uh, the one prediction that is totally safe is that we are going to underappreciate and get wrong AI's uh, impact over the next five years. So it's it's uh, it's going to be a big deal, but uh, uh, how it's going to be a big deal, we're just going to have to live and learn together. 
Well, this conversation has been a big deal for me. It's really lovely to have people I think so highly have spent some time, but we have five questions we ask every guest and I am running low on time. So I'm going to go there. Um, and I'm going to start with Rod because I've started with you the whole time. We're going to stay on a theme. So the first question is the podcast is called more than a test, but everyone thinks that means something different. When you heard the words more than a test, what did it mean to you? I mean, I, I'm, but this is me. I think <laughs> I was thinking about life, like life is more than a test, right? So that it's sort of, it's everything but the test to my point about how to story tell, uh, earlier. So that's how I thought about it. Mark, same question. Yeah, uh, well, naturally, I had the Amira uh, uh, idea in mind, which is that uh, uh, we try to be more than an assessment. We try to be uh, really a diagnostic that uh, gets uh, beyond uh, levels of achievement and gets to the why. So, Like I said, Mark, always on brand. All right, Mark, you have to tell <laughs> us one lit moment from your life. And what we mean by a lit moment is a moment with you in a book that either changed who you are or changed your course or is like your happy place. So tell us your lit moment. Yeah. So so a lit moment for me was with a book called Godel Escher Bach. I don't know if uh, uh, too many folks have come across it, but it was a thing for a while. And, and, and what it really got me focused on was the notion that uh, uh, if we're going to be creators, we have to be about patterns. Uh, that was a, a real wake up call for me. All right, Rod, your turn. All right. So I come with, I, I'm going to take a totally different tact with this. Again, I was hoping I like, you would. I like, I like, for me, I think anybody can, I mean, there are right, millions of titles out there, about seven things to do, sort of <laughs> teachings in that manner. I like things that make me take me way out of my comfort zone or make me think back to a different time. Like it sort of transports me. So two things. One would be, I don't have it here with me, but uh, I just think it's such a great, because I love the the rhythm of it. I'm a big thing about rhythm and language. Um, and I think it drops walls, which is goodbye moon. True. Right? So w parents out there, and my kids are older than, much older than that. Uh, but going back to what that experience is, I think it, it's more powerful for even parents than it is maybe than the child that's listening to the parent read that book. And the second one I, I'll show you here, I've used this in, in public speaking opportunities, but it's what do you do with an idea? This is a fantastic children's book. So anybody who can see that. Uh, but it's a young person who treats an idea as, as if it's an egg, right? And, and sort of when to bring it out, when to show it, how to protect it, how to understand ownership of an idea. Um, so it's, you know, <laughs> I'll be a guy in his 40s who will find a kid's book and that will inspire me to either ask a different question of a mark, right? Or another CEO or investor or celebrity, um, because hopefully that's going to be one of those questions they haven't had before, but we'll get them thinking. That's awesome. You said goodbye moon, but I think you mean good night moon. And I good really love moon. that. Good you... night moon. Thank you. No, I, no I, please. <laughs> it's okay. I appreciate it though. I will tell you that as someone who read that book as a teacher and all these things, and then I read it as a parent for the first time and sat there and sobbed being like, oh, now I get it. I get what we're doing now. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I appreciate you bringing it up. All right, Rod, a uh, piece of technology you love. That I love. Oh, I don't know. My phone is my probably my number one because it's my that you know what it is? It's my library. It's my storytelling hub. If I'm really honest, it's it's where I go and I, I realize a, a new podcast that I just stumbled upon that I am absolutely in love with. And I encourage people. It's Julia Louis Dreyfus from Seinfeld. Her uh, it's called Wiser Than Me. And it's a fantastic podcast about she interviews women that are older than her, like a Jane Fonda or Carol Burnett to learn about their life and wisdom. And I found that through my library, i.e. my phone. So it's my, that's my everything. All right, Mark, before you answer, I'm going to tell you my favorite piece of technology that you own is for a long time, I don't know if you still do, Mark had a rose gold laptop. And our entire company oh, wow. had stories about why he had a rose gold laptop. Like the only person <laughs> in our company with a rose. So finally, one day, Mark and I are in New York and I asked him, I was like, hey, we've all got like these like urban legends about why Mark has a rose gold laptop. And Mark, and I, no joke, Mark, I ask him, I'm like, why do you have a rose? And, and he tilts the computer down and goes, huh. And then goes back to working. Like had no, we're all talking about this pink laptop all day long. Mark had no idea he had a pink laptop. All right, Mark, your favorite piece of technology. So so I'm going to stick with the Elon Musk uh, theme. My favorite technology from the last uh, few months is I got my Starlink terminal. And now I can get internet anywhere. Wow. It is. And I live out in the country. So it's been a big deal for me. So. 
Yep. That's like a fun, that's like a name drop in interview, but like a tech drop. I love that. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark, best advice you've ever been given. Uh, wow. Best advice I've ever been given. So it, it, it came, believe it or not, from a private equity person. And he told me that uh, uh, after working with me for a few years, the only thing that he would suggest is, is that uh, no matter whether I am working or whether I am with my family, that I needed to be all in equally as much. And yeah. I have really benefited from that advice because yeah, it's easy for me sometimes to be all in at work and uh, that all in at work bleeds into the family situation. And I try to fix that. Rod, your best advice? This goes back a few decades, but it was an educator that saw something in me and got me on the path of my public speaking. And when I was traveling the country as a 17 year old speaking, it was all because of a math teacher. And he, it's it still in my life to this day, he just told me to always be me, which sounds incredibly simple. Um, but what he was trying to say was when I am authentic, when I am kind of in search of that truth, that I can make a difference. And when I try to be anything other than that, like my wife says, I try to be funny. <laughs> that means I'm not very successful at it. That I shouldn't be that. I should just be who I am because I feel, uh, I feel my own unique sort of spot um, in the roster of humanity. I love that, the roster of humanity. What's, what was the math teacher's name? Chuck May. Great. Uh, last question, Rod, starting with you, a book everyone should read. Well, I'm going to go back. I'm going to stick with my one. I'm going to say, what do you do with an idea by Kobe Amata? Uh, it's an award-winning book. Uh, I would check that out. I think everything else I read is around uh, screenwriting and, and public speak, just stuff that's very tactical um, that I don't know is terribly inspiring in that manner. <laughs> screenwriting. Is there like a Rod Berger movie TV show coming out soon? Uh, there are some things coming up. <laughs> All right. You heard it here first. All right, Mark, a book everyone should read. Uh, I'm going to riff on Rod's story about Uganda. I read a book recently called Strength and What Remains by Tracy Kidder that uh, is all about the genocides in Africa. That was pretty profound. And on that, that's what we're going to end with today. So thank you both so much for your time. I know a little bit of how busy you both are and how much commitment you have to the work that you're doing. So thanks for spending some time with us today, answering a lot of questions on everything from storytelling to AI to the people who have changed you. I appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us on the More Than a Test podcast. If you found this conversation valuable, subscribe to our YouTube channel and find us on your favorite podcast platform. At Amira Learning, we believe every child deserves a chance to become a reader, and we're excited to be part of this conversation. See you next week, and thanks for joining.